a fine Jedi council here in the second hour of the war room. We have had multiple Jedis come through. We've already had Michael Snyder. We're going to have Steve Pachenik later as well as Mike Adams. Full-on Jedi, uh, Jedi convention here on the war room today on a Thursday. And as the return of the Jedi is happening politically right now in America, the one world government agenda is falling apart at the seams right in front of us. Here's John Bounds' report. The New World Order, put simply, a conglomerate of multinational financial interests and its subsequent intelligentsia bent on undermining the self-determination of sovereign nations by any means necessary. Now, the steady rise of populism has the globalists crying from the rooftops. Former Senator and U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel was recently quoted by the Lincoln Journal Star saying, A new world order is being built and shaped right now. And the last time that happened, America led. We've done the hard work of freedom. And tonight, we lead the world in facing down a threat to decency and humanity. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future. Hegel claims the Trump administration's withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement did significant damage to long-term U.S. power and influence in Asia while damaging the interests of U.S. farmers and ranchers. The reality is, had the United States signed on to the TPP, the TPP would have obliterated sovereignty in favor of multinational corporate looting and ushered in a technocratic nightmare. Meanwhile, George Soros grapples with defeat after dropping $18 billion on his open society foundations to undermine Western civilization. Soros, complaining to the Financial Times, said, It's deja vu all over again with one big change. The dominant ideology in the world now is nationalism. It's the EU that's the institution that's on the verge of a breakdown. As German Chancellor Angela Merkel's future looks bleak, French President Macron is being lauded as the Hegelian hero of EU history by the EU observer. Yet Macron's approval continues to stagnate behind policies such as pushing carbon taxes at the borders. And the PSYOP intensifies from the globalist mouthpiece of the Council of Foreign Relations, signaling the coming wave of hypocrisy to once again attempt to sway the masses. Clifford Cunningham writes, a summary of the report released by Freedom House, a supposedly nonpartisan think tank, has placed blame for the global assault on democracy on President Trump's attack on the press and brash foreign policy as America's democratic standards, quote, erode at an accelerating pace, end quote. On January 24th, President Trump's populism will face the New World Order at Ground Zero in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum, revealing a parade of elitists drowning under a tsunami of populism with tentacles that own the media, reach into the deep state, and continue to dump billions into a money pit of treason. John Bound reporting for Infowars.com. And what is going to happen as all these investigations are now taking a 180 degree turn and looking right at Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation? All of these anti-Trumpers, all those Hillary Clinton supporters are going to feel really stupid and they're going to have an opportunity to come back to reality or will they double down on their insanity and go completely mental? Oh my gosh, what would that look like? On the other side, it's Roger Stone. This is The War Room. Welcome back. You're on The War Room. This is Freedom Command Central. And you're with your hosts, Roger Stone and Owen Troyer. You know, and you've got a long background as a sports reporter and broadcaster. I've been wondering for a long time what was going on with the NFL. And then I finally think I figured it out. You see, I couldn't figure out why the NFL was allowing the kneeling protests to go forward game after game. The damage to the NFL brand is crystal clear. 
viewership is way down. Ratings are way down. They're disgusting most decent Americans. So why would the NFL permit such a negative impression about the league to self-perpetuate? But after reading today's news, I think I may finally be beginning to understand of it. You see, there was a very telling story on page one of the New York Times just a couple days ago. And one of the things you learn in the realm of political tricks, of which I am, of course, a master, is the strategy of using something incredibly negative to cover up something even more negative. In this case, that's exactly what I think they're doing. So what could be worse than a bunch of seemingly ungrateful players being paid literally millions and millions of dollars uh, taking a knee at these games? What could be worse than that? Well, now I'm beginning to understand. You see, as many folks know, but so many don't, the NFL Football Players Union filed a lawsuit against the NFL for too many past players who've ended up with lifetime disabilities due to traumatic head injuries leading to lasting injuries and, of course, death. Some of these cases go back as far as 2012. The class action suit was ostensibly settled to the satisfaction of the players' union, uh, and a, an extraordinary amount was set aside in January uh, 7, 2017, when the settlement went into effect. Now, we're still researching the exact details of what happened to whom in this very complicated legal case, but out of 20,000 class members, the overwhelming majority of whom are African Americans, do you know how many cases they've paid out on? 1,594. This, of course, uh, is after the doctors have proved that these kind of head injuries lead to dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS. Uh, this is called death with CTE, chronic, traumatic, encephalopathy. Pardon me. Groucho Marx couldn't have done it that well. Well done, Roger. Uh, so due to the difficulty of setting up a claim, which seems to be a moving target created by the NFL lawyers as to what constitutes a submitted claim, they have paid out a paltry amount. This leaves many thousands of families and people destitute. It's absolutely true. Oh, and some of these NFL players' families are on food stamps. One NFL player is working as a pizza delivery boy because it's the only work he can get to, to support his family. So we're going to be digging into here at the War Room what exactly is going on here and why only 1,594 of these accepted complete submitted claims and actually only 91 people have been paid, less than 6% of the entire class. I now understand why the NFL has been allowing the kneeling to continue. They're waiting for these players to die. That way they don't have to pay. We are really going to we are really going to grind down here at the war room on this story because there is so much more to know. But the NFL doesn't want to pay the players because it's akin to admitting guilt. They set up these uh, protocols to avoid head injury, yet you see them putting their players right back in the game. No, I think Roger Goodell is going to have some explaining to do. Well, this is actually a huge story, Roger, and I think that you've kind of discovered something here, and that is the NFL. When you talk about them with the way they've handled the kneeling thing and kept this concussion CTE story out of the headlines, one thing that I have to credit the NFL for is they are really, really good. They really understand how to steal headlines and how to generate attention and to distract from other things. This is something that they've really become masters at since Roger Goodell became the commissioner. I'll, I'll provide a couple examples. You'll notice a couple things about the NFL. One you'll notice is every offseason there's a huge narrative that everyone's talking about, whether it be – Tom Brady, Brady deflating footballs or a Ray Rice video. There's always one story that the NFL uses during the offseason or Michael Sam, the first gay football player, whatever it is. There's always one story the NFL uses during the offseason to generate attention, generate interest, and just keep the rumor mill abuzz so that they can control the narrative, control the attention, and continue to be watched and thought of as significant even during the offseason. So, Roger, you have correctly identified that the NFL could be letting these Neils steal the spotlight and become the big story to avoid the CTE 
becoming the big narrative. And, and of course, this is on the heels of the movie that came out with Will Smith in it called Concussion just a couple years ago. You had the documentary on PBS called The League of Shadows where the doctor that Will Smith portrayed in that movie actually talks about how the NFL was burying his studies. But here's, a, here's the amazing thing that I think I just figured out right now, Roger, listening to your monologue. I have wondered for years what blackmail Roger Goodell has on the NFL. Does he have pictures? Does he know stuff about families? How, what blackmail does Roger Goodell have on the NFL? Because this is a commissioner who in the last couple of years has seen nothing but declining ratings. He's done nothing for the families that have suffered with their with the players getting CTE and everything it's done to them, leading to multiple suicides of NFL players. And he's now making more money than ever as the league is collapsing. And I'm sitting here scratching my head. How can Roger Goodell manipulate and twist the league into a headlock when he has done nothing positive for the league in years? And Roger, it just hit me. He is keeping the information about CTE in his pocket, and I think that's what it is. I think that's what the blackmail is. Roger Goodell is telling the NFL, give me $50 million a year, give me access to the private jet, or I'm going to walk out of here and tell everyone the truth about CTE and tell all the players how they're putting their lives at stake every time they take the field. I think that that might be how Roger Goodell is able to manipulate these unprecedented $50 million a year contracts out of the NFL. And I'll tell you, Roger, I know that you're working behind the scenes. This is something that we're going we're gonna to blow the lid off of. Well, I think a lot of people don't know that Roger Goodell, of course, is the son of extreme left-wing Senator Charles Goodell, who was an apologist for the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War, a moderate Republican who shifted far left in the 70s and was defeated by the late, uh, par pardon me, defeated by Senator James L. Buckley in 1970. So uh, the apple has not fallen far from the tree, Owen. It just, it, it. It all made sense listening to you break it down, Roger, because it, it doesn't make see because it doesn't make sense when you take it at face value. When you take it at face value and you see Roger Roger Goodell makes more money now than ever, even though the league is tanking, it doesn't make any sense when you say, Why would the NFL continue to let these these anthem kneelers persist, even though it's killing their ratings and it's bad for the country and it's bad for the league? But then it just all made sense. You broke it down. Well, it distracts from the fact that the league is about to be hit with some serious CTE issues with these former players, and it distracts from the fact that Roger Goodell is bending over the league sideways and having his way with them. Funny. And it all plays into the NFL's ability to manipulate the media. Well, what I find most offensive about this is that it's racist. You see, because these folks are black, they figure they can't get the wherewithal to get anybody's attention. They have no resources. Their lawyers haven't been paid. Oh, the administrators for the fund have been paid literally millions of dollars. So the lawyers are making money, the lawyers for the NFL, but the individual player families are being starved out. It is a, a, it's an ignominious, racist disaster. Well, you know, I, I've been a fan of the NFL. I've worked NFL games. I, I like the NFL, but, I mean, look, here's the deal, NFL. You better write your ship or you're going to have a, a long and hard fall because the, the, the higher up you are, the bigger they are, the harder they're, they're going to fall. And now you've got other people interested in starting new football leagues. That could be a death blow to the NFL. So this is a story that Roger Stone and myself are going to be continuing to cover and work on the different angles to find out what the truth is. And we'll see if the NFL wants to correct the ship or go down with the sinking ship. We'll be right back with Roger Stone. This is The War Room. We're back on the War Room, and yes, we've got a jam-packed program for you this evening. You know, Owen, one of the things I always think is laughable is the way that the permanent political class thinks that governing uh, should be left entirely to them. And they resent it when anyone from a different discipline or a different background goes into politics, such as, oh, I don't know, uh, Donald Trump. By the way, great electric blue tie today. Great tie. Uh, so I've seen this now manifest itself directly when I gave a terrific interview with Patrick Slevin uh, in Florida of his highly influential newsletter. And I mentioned the idea of Terry Bolea, the actor who portrays Hulk Hogan, running for the United States Senate. 
Bolia is a Republican, and he actually was active on behalf of Barack Obama, to which I say, well, everyone makes mistakes. Uh, and uh, this idea has now taken off uh, like a rocket ship. What we have going on in Florida is Hulk mania. Now, I am scheduled to meet with Hogan, at least that's what I believe, uh, through intermediaries, but the story's gotten ahead of itself. Let's go to the TMZ tape and see what they came up with. Roger Stone is a fan of yours and thinks you should make a run for the U.S. Senate. What's your reaction? Well, my reaction is, if I run, I will win. Brother, I, I don't want to run, okay? I'm ha I have a great life here on the beach, you know. Um, if every, The only thing I'm going to make a run for is the world title again, if I ever do any running. But right now, I'm just hanging out on the beach having a blast. Would you ever consider running for Senate in Florida? <clears throat> Thought about it. I've had, as of late, people calling my phone, driving me crazy about running for Senate. They want me to run for governor. They want me to run for mayor. Um, at the end of the day, I'm just so confused because it's like watching the politicians, the Democrats and the Republicans, it's like nobody wants to work together. It's like a wrestling match with two wrestlers that are supposed to work together and paint this beautiful wrestling picture. The Republicans and Democrats act like they hate each other and they don't want to do anything except create chaos. So I really don't want to be any part of that. So is that a no? That's a no, man. I don't want to get in the middle of that. If you ran, what party? Oh, listen to you. I would be a Republican. You supported Barack Obama. Well, yes, I did. Yes, I did. But you would be a Republican. I would be a Republican. Is this a flat-out no that you would never consider running for Senate in Florida? Right now, this moment, it's a flat-out no. That's hedging. Right now, this moment, it's a flat-out no. Is it possible next month it could be maybe or yes? It, it could be. That sounds like you're not saying no. I'm saying no in this moment. You know, the funny part is, I mean, after seeing, you know, Donald Trump's fan base and watching what Jesse Ventura did, you know, in the state of Florida, I mean, I, I got a feeling it'd be, it wouldn't be that hard. <laughs> you know, I really do. All right, so brother. There you have Hulk Hogan handling an interview more skillfully than perhaps any politician I've ever seen. And I looked for the Sherman-esque no. I was waiting for him to say, absolutely not, never going to happen. And I didn't hear that. So I say, go, Hulk, go. Go, Hulk, go. It's a grassroots movement, and I'm going to get this guy in the race if I possibly can. Now, he did raise one possibility, and that is running for governor. As uh, his friend and my friend, Jesse Ventura, did, uh, it's important to have men and women who come from a different discipline, who aren't career political creatures looking for the next contribution and who are afraid to take on the entrenched special interests. I think Hulk Hogan's got a lot of heart and a lot of brains. He's uh, an actor. His real name is Terry Bollea. And as we know, two of our greatest presidents came from the entertainment business, Ronald Reagan and Donald J. Trump. Let's, uh, I think we have a, a video now of our friends from TMZ. Let's see how they handle this because they are kind of part of the elitist system. Can we roll that? How do you feel about Hulk Hogan wanting to run, or should he run? Well, I first suggested this on a blog uh, for my friend uh, Patrick Slevin. Yeah. Uh, and it's taken on a life of its own. I just saw an interview with Hulk Hogan, whose real name is Terry Bollea. Yeah. And of course, he's an entertainer, like Ronald Reagan, who became president, like Donald Trump, who became president. Uh, and while he said he's not running right now, he very clearly left the door open. Look, I think it's important to have people who come from outside the parameters of career politicians and politics. It brings a fresh perspective. He's a very successful businessman, entrepreneur, and entertainer. Why not, Terry Bollea? Why, why not? But why, why, why should he run, especially in Florida? Well, because he lives in Florida. He is a Republican. Uh, and because he has enormous name identification through his role as an entertainer. It's very hard to get elected to public office if nobody knows who you are, but everybody knows who Hulk Hogan is. He, he has a, a, a history. I mean, he's on WE because he had the whole uh, scandal. You think that would affect his chances? 
chances if he were to actually run for Senate? Uh, it certainly didn't hurt Jesse Ventura in his bid to be governor of Minnesota, where he was a reform-oriented governor. I really hope Mr. Belia will consider this. He also voted for Obama. We all make mistakes. Well, there you have it. That's uh, called a fedora, by the way, uh, the kind of headgear that was favored by Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, it's uh, pretty chilly here in New York. Uh, look, I think this is a story we're also going to be following. I'd like to get uh, Terry Belia, also known as Hulk Hogan, on the show. He's a patriotic American. I understand he shares many of our libertarian views. We have absolutely confirmed that he is a Republican and he deeply regrets his support for Barack Obama, just as I deeply regret my support for George Bush. We all make big mistakes. Well, Roger, this is a man, Hulk Hogan, the wrestler, who came in to the song, I'm a Real American. I mean, it's perfect. He can come in every time he delivers a campaign speech to the exact same theme music he was coming into for decades. But, you know, uh, Hulk Hogan, if you do get this message, you said something in that, in that TMZ video about Democrats and Republicans fighting and how you don't want to get in the middle of it. I think the important thing to realize is that this isn't that Democrats and Republicans are fighting with each other. It's not really a fight with each other. It's a fight over the country. Democrats don't have Americans' interest at heart. Democrats don't care about American citizens. You can see that now. They didn't want to cut the taxes. They want sanctuary cities. They want to shut down the government over non-citizens. So this isn't about Democrats fighting Republicans. This is about Democrats fighting America. This is about people and getting people in the government that want to stand up for America against the Democrat agenda to destroy America, Roger. I think that that's something that perhaps if, if Mr. Bolia realized, he might become more interested. Well, but he, it's very important to note that he's picked up on one of the major themes that allowed Donald Trump to pull off the greatest upset in American political history. People are sick and tired of the two-party duopoly uh, and the career politicians that have driven this country into the ground. Well, you heard it here first. They wanted Roger's take. Now it's a big story. Will Hulk Hogan run for Senate? He won't be the first person from the WWE to run for office, and he probably won't be the last. We're going to have more on the other side with Roger Stone, and Jerry Corsi joins us as well. This is The War Room. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to The War Room. This is part of the expanded programming here at InfoWars. Now, if you like uh, our new expanded programming, David Knight in the morning with the real news of my colleague Owen Schroyer and I here at The War Room, and of course the great Alex Jones midday, please recognize that we are completely and totally supported by listener and viewer uh, support. We have no right-wing fat cats sitting in the, in the wings writing big checks. We are controlled by no one. InfoWars is completely and totally independent, and we can bring you the truth because there are no corporate interests telling us what we can and cannot do. That's what makes the stone cold truth so effective here at InfoWars. But we need your support to keep this expansion going. And right now we have some extraordinary sales going on at the store that'll help you and your family and help us pay for the state-of-the-art new, new facilities and expanded programming that Alex Jones has in mind. So whether it is the Super Alpha Mail Pack, which includes Alpha Power and the Super Mal Vitality uh, formula, or whether you are going for the uh, Immune Wall, which with this flu bug going around, believe me, you need. This flu is the worst I have ever experienced. I'm reading more and more about people it is felling, but I can tell you this is the best all natural immunity formula I have found on the market. You can go to CVS, you can go to Walgreens, you can get products that sound like what we're selling at InfoWars, but the quality is not as good and they don't have the thousands and thousands of endorsements from actual customers who are very pleased with what we have sold them. So folks, help yourself, help the fight for freedom. It's a 360 win. Go to the InfoWars store now. All right. Well, we've got is uh, is uh, Jerry with us, guys. So we've got a Jedi Council here with Roger Stone and Jerry Corsi. And Jerry, you broke the story at Infowars.com earlier today. 
FBI has launched three investigations into Clinton's second special counsel to investigate Clinton crimes. Talk about this right now. So we've got three different investigations going on to uh, the Clintons, and that is the Clinton Foundation money laundering, the Uranium One scandal, and the secret server. How are these investigations developing right now, Dr. Corsi? Well, and again, I think they're extremely important, and uh, President Trump appears to be proceeding very methodically, very determined fashion to really get solid investigations underway that will uh, result in indictments. I mean, the first one in Little Rock, Arkansas and New York, the FBI has begun a serious pay to play investigation into the Clintons on the Clinton Foundation. Uh, also looking at enormous the use of the Clinton Foundation proceeds for personal gain. Uh, that could easily already have resulted in a grand jury because people are being called to testify. And I think you're going to find uh, serious issues and indictments coming out of that. Uh, secondly, we know through a letter that was authorized, uh, authored by uh, House Judiciary Chairman Bob Goodlatt, uh, that Attorney General Sessions has assigned to several Department of Justice prosecutors to make recommendations on reopening this DOJ investigation into the Uranium One scandal, particularly into accusations that the Department of Justice held from CFIUS, the Treasury Committee that approved the sale of, um, uh, of Uranium One to the Russian Atomic Energy Agency, withheld information that there was a bribery investigation from Russian agents in the United States ongoing when this was approved when the CFIUS, Hillary Clinton, a member of CFIUS, approved the idea to sell Uranium One to Rose Adam. And the, by that process, the Russians gained 20% of the U.S. uranium. That's another investigation going. Uh, the third investigation uh, looks to be opened up in the Freedom of Information Act that Judicial Watch got. We now know that Huma Ahmadine had transferred something like 2,800 State Department work-related emails onto the laptop of uh, her husband, Anthony Weiner, and some included classified uh, passport information, which is password information, basically, that President Trump has charged were you know, at risk of putting um, this information in the hands of foreign agents. And then finally, we've got the Department, uh, uh, Department of Justice Inspector General Michael Horowitz, who's confirmed to Senator Grassley, his office is investigating emails written between former FBI counterintelligence head Peter Strozik and uh, the prosecutor, Lisa Page, in which Strozik said we need an insurance policy. Strozik also is the one who recommended that Comey change the language in his draft about Hillary's email service from gross, grossly negligent to extremely careless. Now, these are four investigations, and Charles, Mar Charles Ortel, uh, a very close friend and a very thorough researcher, is, as pointed out, is also includes some investigations going on right now in Australia, in which the Australian government is really concerned that something like $80 million was transferred to the Clinton Foundation in a fraudulent fashion, uh, including money that went to the Clinton HIV AIDS initiative, uh, this is, you know, it's very serious. These are very serious accusations, and foreign investigations could also prompt further investigations in the United States. Now, the reason I wrote the article is most people aren't aware of how much serious investigation is going on, and we've already had one indictment come down last Friday in the Uranium One investigation, uh, which we did not know was coming down, and that was developed by the local. FBI and regional FBI, not the FBI in Washington. Now, these are major developments because what they indicate to me is that uh, below the surface, there is uh, already starting the Trump counter revolution, which is going to result in major, I think, uh, indictments coming down against a wide range of figures, including some formerly very high officials of the government including Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And from what we're learning even today about the um, Senate, the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Nunes's committee, and the release of this four-page memo, which looks like it puts the Fusion GPS 
uh, dossier at the heart of getting the uh, electronic surveillance approval for the FISA court. Now, I, I have to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt you here, Dr. Corsi. Is that, <clears throat> is that the same classified report that Ron DeSantis was saying need to be released to the public today that hadn't been released, or is this a different one? This is the one that just came out today and that DeSantis is talking about. Okay, also, so now this is actually key here. Now, yes. this story came out this morning. FBI chief of staff to testify before House members on Clinton probe. Now, they talked to the Bureau's chief of staff, James Rabicki, and the topic of that conversation was, as Dr. Corsi was mentioning earlier, why former director James Comey did not recommend criminal charges against failed presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. So that meeting goes down. Then Ron DeSantis goes to Twitter and says, the classified report compiled by House Intelligence is deeply troubling and raises serious questions about the upper echelon of the Obama DOJ, Bruce Orr, and Comey's FBI as it relates to the so-called collusion investigation. Are we finally starting to see all the puzzle pieces come together here, Dr. Corsi? I really think so. And because now just take a look. You've got uh, the Department of Justice engaging uh, the FBI at local levels of investigations. You've got the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, and you've got the various intelligence and justice committees in Congress all beginning to release indictments and very serious information of a criminal wow, nature. it's all coming down. It's a 180 degree. They thought they were going to get Trump on all this. It looks like it's going to be Hillary and James Comey. We're going to have more of that on the other side. Welcome back to the War Room. You're with Dr. Jerry Corsi, the Washington Bureau Chief of uh, InfoWars, and perhaps one of the very best, certainly the most dogged investigative reporters working today. Uh, he's just given you groundbreaking news about a new focus on the Clintons in this administration, but I'd now like to get to the topic that interests me the most, and that is, where is Julian Assange and what is in his future? Uh, Dr. Corsi uh, was one of the first journalists in the country to suss out the importance of QAnon as a source and to begin to put together the puzzles of exactly what's going on. So, Dr. Corsi, take it away. Uh, well, Roger, on December 25th on Christmas, QAnon posted this very cryptic, uh, uh, I guess basically four or five, six lines that said essentially that Assange was going to be able to get out of, was going to be extradited from London on January 5th and 6th. And the details were given in this that were enough for me to take it seriously. I began looking at it and began realizing that the, the, set, the, the, the stage had been set. Because in fact, in your case, your district case, court case, uh, President Trump sent attorneys from the uh, office of the president to argue that Assange had committed no crime because under a U.S., a New York Times v. Sullivan and New York Times v. U.S., it's depending on papers case, Assange had the right to publish the Democratic National Committee emails even if they were classified information and stolen. Now, we then found out after I started publishing this, and I think uh, President Trump was following the whole case very, I think, leading the case. I think this is another really quite brilliant move by Donald Trump that we uh, found out that Assange had a diplomatic passport given to him. He was naturalized by Ecuador and got a diplomatic passport. And that had occurred on December 12th. Yet for one month, Ecuador kept it secret. Now, to me, that would be the perfect time once Julian Assange had a passport. Julian Assange was posting on his website this music from MIA and you know the song was we can go across the borders we have a passport I uh, was tell telegraphing Julian Assange was on his Twitter account that he was going to get out so what a perfect time this window between the 12th to plan it to on uh, January 5th have um, get him outside of London you know take him on a disguise put him on trains uh, you don't have to have nearly the passport clearance on trains you do on airports, get over to Paris and take the uh, Trégon Grand Vitesse, the very fast French train, to Geneva. And I believe that uh, Julian Assange is in Geneva and has been there since the 6th of January, uh, extracted out of London. And I point out to everybody that we 
have had no comments from Donald Trump uh, saying that we're going to prosecute Assange. You know, Great Britain has said, well, they want him for this technical violation of violating his essentially his bail. But, you know, the Swedish government has dropped the rape charges against Assange. And if Trump really was going to arrest Assange, he could easily have been making statements today saying Assange had committed crimes and we're going to have a, an indictment of Assange and arrest him as soon as we could. Trump has not done that. Uh, all the signs indicate to me that QAnon was right and that what we're going to see is a uh, meeting between Julian Assange and President Trump on the 23rd of January when Donald Trump announced he's going to Davos, Switzerland, which again gives an opportunity, has never done that. Donald Trump has, I don't think, ever been to Davos, Switzerland. This is an opportunity if if Assange is there to meet with him and perhaps bring him back to the United States, which would be a great coup. And I believe that Assange has the information, which would be the final death blow for Hillary Clinton and this entire Russian collusion narrative. And I think the deep state would be dealt a severe blow uh, and uh, President Obama for violating all the FISA court rules and using this Fusion GPS to essentially conduct electronic surveillance on the campaign of a GOP candidate for president, which would be unprecedented in U.S. history. Uh, that was a terrific summary. I think the key thing for people to understand here is that uh, you can't be in court on behalf of Donald Trump arguing that Assange has not violated the law in the publication of classified information, even if it was purloined, yet have your uh, CIA director and your attorney general arguing that Julian Assange violated the law by publishing this material and he should be prosecuted. From our point of view here at InfoWars, we believe Julian Assange is a journalist. And if you're going to arrest people for the publication of classified information, well, you better line up the New York Times and the Washington Post. Get some shackles for Bob Woodward. They do it every single day. The New York, uh, the courts have held, as you pointed out, that these are perfectly legal functions of a free press. So it is time to end the prosecution uh, of Assange. Hillary Clinton wanted to hit him with a drone. Uh, the Secretary of State, John Kerry, traveled to London to argue with the British government that they should rescind their recognition of Ecuador for one day so that thugs could storm the embassy and arrest this crusading journalist. God bless you, Julian Assange, wherever you are. Well, and now we know why Hillary Clinton wanted to drone him as I'm, I'm piping in here, guys, because I think we've got some breaking news here that I want to get Dr. Corsi's opinion on. As you bring up Fusion GPS, <clears throat> it's just been released Glenn Simpson's House testimony has a discrepancy as far as his Senate testimony is concerned, where in his Senate testimony, he admitted to knowing Bill Browder when he was with the Wall Street Journal in 2009. Then in his House testimony, he said he never had heard of Browder or knew who, who he was until 2013. Now, all of a sudden, Glenn Simpson is on the, the high wire and Glenn Simpson might have to explain himself. How about that? Well, I think there's going to be a number of discrepancies in uh, Simpson's testimony. Also, from what was released by Senator Feinstein, uh, he initially didn't know anything. He said he didn't remember anything, didn't know anything. Uh, I think this also this four page memo that um, uh, Ron DeSantis is talking about uh, is going to be explosive. So I think we're about to see the release of massive amounts of information that are going to uh, just simply bury uh, the mm -hmm. Russian collusion argument. Uh, and uh, I, I want to go back to what Roger said on Julian Assange. I mean, you know, this was in Roger Stone's case, this, you know, this whole Russian collusion case that Donald Trump sent the attorneys from the White House to argue that Julian Assange had done nothing wrong. Now, that was an incredibly important signal that was heard around the world. I think it encouraged the Ecuadorian government, who I believe has been working in conjunction with our government, to find a way to get Assange into the United States. It's just like there's no law against Russian collusion, and there's no law, in fact, the First Amendment protects a journalist who is going to publish classified information uh, that was given to them, even if that information was stolen. That's the Pentagon Papers case. Uh, this, these are very critical landmark decisions. 
And Julian Assange needs to be recognized as one of the most courageous journalists in the world. And Donald Trump already owes a great debt and has acknowledged it to Julian Assange for the release of the DNC emails and Podesta's air emails during the campaign. Uh, and again, they were so damaging, not because they were stolen, but because of what Podesta and Hillary Clinton and the others wrote in those emails that they never wanted the American public to see. Uh, the Julian Assanges are true heroes, and we need to celebrate them. We need to bring them back to the United States, and I hope President Trump does it. You know, President Trump gives him a position, a watch guard position over some of the agencies of intelligence in the U.S. government. I'd love to see Julian Assange be given assignments to investigate the NSA, to investigate various of the other agencies. And remember, Admiral Rogers, who is leaving the NSA, is one of the real heroes who came over November 17th or 18th after the election in 2016 and told President-elect Trump that he was under court-ordered surveillance from the Obama administration. It was shocking to Donald Trump. The next day, Donald Trump moved the transition team to Bedminster out of the Trump Tower and began tweeting that President Obama was wiretapping him, which was correct. Jerry, let me ask you one more question before we go here. Why was the FBI telling Trump that Russia was trying to blackmail him with information at the same time the FBI was saying that Trump colluded with Russia? How does that make sense? Why did that happen? Well, again, you, you've got contradictory stories coming out of the FBI because this thing has been convoluted and had many different trails to it. But the fundamental basis, and I think President Trump was on this case again, and he's absolutely correct that there has not been a scintilla of evidence of Russian collusion. I mean, you can ask Roger Stone. Roger Stone's been put through. Yeah, and that was his fake news award of the year. Roger Stone, Jerry Corsi, that's the Jedi Council. This is The War.